All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you for joining this webinar at uh, this wonderful Saturday morning. Um, this is a really exciting topic um, to talk about uh, vehicle to grid and vehicle to home. Um, it's an emerging technology that I think that 2023 will be the, a year of major change. Um, and so we'll uh, get to it. So uh, uh, if you are new to the webinar series, um, uh, Solar Oregon is a Oregon nonprofit uh, that is um, has a mission to educate, outreach, and do community and advocacy work uh, regarding solar. Um, the goal is to get uh, more people uh, to adopt solar and solar plus storage. Um, we also uh, provide tours uh, of utility scale tours, uh, utility scale solar, as well as um, home tours of uh, homes that have solar and, uh, you know, is in the process of, you know, installing solar also. Um, and then we also do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer education uh, events. Um, this is one. And then we also do a lot of presentations about how to go solar plus storage. And uh, feel free to um, donate to uh, the Solar Oregon cause. Um, we are a largely member-driven organization, uh, very few paid staff. Um, I am on the board of Solar Oregon, uh, but I'm not a paid staff. Um, and so the work done to make these presentations possible is a, a voluntary uh, effort, um, but uh, you know, feel free to support our work. And um, uh, feel free to shout out to us uh, if you have trouble with any of the chat or Q&A features, but uh, feel free to use the chat and Q&A feature um, to ask questions. And uh, my name is Edward Louie. I work at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory as my day job. Uh, I am there as a building energy efficiency research engineer. Um, outside of work, I'm finishing the inside uh, to a off-grid zero energy tiny house that I built from the ground up. The uh, trailer came with nothing on it. It was just a bare steel tiny house trailer. Um, and then I built the walls, the floor, the roof and did all the work. And um, now it's just a matter of finishing out the inside. Um, a disclaimer, uh, the views of this presentation do not necessarily reflect the positions of Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, U.S. Department of Energy, or Solar Oregon. I have made a best effort to convey facts and information accurately. However, you're encouraged to do your own research before you go out and make an investment decision. And so this presentation, um, we're going to go over some electric vehicle standards, um, talking about plug standards and uh, bi-directional charging standards. Um, then we'll go over some cars with a bi-directional plug. Um, and then we'll look into cars that have bi-directional plug and the software capabilities enable, to enable bi-directionality enabled. Uh, it's a much smaller list, you'll find out. Um, and then also we'll look into efforts in the commercial vehicle landscape um, that are also pursuing bi-directional um, capabilities. And then we'll look at uh, the charging infrastructure, um, traditional EV chargers versus uh, EV chargers that are capable of bidirectionality, meaning that it can charge and discharge your car to be able to power your house or the grid. And then we'll look at a um, little bit into the future, uh, what is on the horizon in vehicle to home, vehicle to grid, and a concept called vehicle to plug or vehicle to load. And so standards, standards, standards. It's all about standards. Um, uh, and in this diagram, you can see we're not 100% there when it comes to standards. There's a lot of plugs involved in electric vehicles, uh, whereas a gasoline spout for a uh, combustion vehicle is the same globally, uh, but that's not the case with electric vehicles. Um, but in here in North America, we really only have um, four, three or four plugs. Um, so I didn't highlight Chatamo, 
which is here. Um, we also have a, a older fleet of vehicles, uh, mostly Nissan Leafs, that also have a Chatham plug. But uh, the reason why I didn't box it in is because even Nissan has made a decision back in 2020 to transition to using the, the CCS, which is called Combined Charging System. And so all new Nissan Leafs since 2020 use CCS. Um, and then the most common uh, vehicle plug you'll see out in the wild is um, this plug here, uh, J1772. Uh, that is uh, the most common plug on all EVs outside of the Tesla world. And then of course, if you have a Tesla, Tesla has its own proprietary plug. Um, the reason for this chart is because of the AC versus DC. So for in order to do vehicle to home or vehicle to grid, in order to get any energy back out of your vehicle to power anything, um, you need to do that through the DC pins. Um, so, and the reason why is because uh, the AC plug only feeds AC into the car, and then the car has an onboard battery charger that takes AC energy and converts it to DC to charge the battery in the car. However, that charger is not capable of converting DC energy back to AC and backfeeding the pins on this uh, AC plug. And the standard for J1772 also does not allow energy to be backfed through these uh, AC pins either. So uh, that's why um, in order to do any sort of vehicle to home or vehicle to grid, it needs to be done through the DC pins. Tesla's plug is also uh, capable of backfeeding DC out of their proprietary plug. Um, we will not talk about that very much in this presentation. The reason being is um, Elon Musk uh, does not really want to put much effort into vehicle to home or vehicle to grid because, well, partly because uh, his company also sells Tesla power walls. And so his concept is why, why would you ever try to discharge a electric vehicle when you can have stationary batteries? Um, but the desire for a lot of people like for the future to be able to do uh, backfeeding of an electric car into a, into a house is to avoid having to buy something expensive like a Tesla Powerwell when you've already made the investment into an electric vehicle. Um, so why not use that battery for dual purposes? And so uh, that's what we'll get into in this presentation. And so besides the standards and what you can and cannot do with the plugs, uh, there's also um, uh, the communication standards and interoperability standards um, outside the physical hardware uh, plug. And the main one to pay attention to this is this ISO uh, 15118 um, standard. And this standard has been in development for many years, but this year is the year when um, the standard has finally been finalized. And so there's now not, it's no longer a draft version. You know, there's been lots of draft versions. Uh, this year is the year when the standard the standard has been finalized, and this standard is critical to allowing a bi-directional uh, vehicle to home and vehicle to grid capabilities. Um, and it, the reason why is because of you know the uh, a lot of the communication protocols and um, you know capabilities um, that need to be kind of figured out in order to allow this to be done both equitably and safely. Um, but uh, if you don't care about any of the details in this uh, uh, chart here, the key thing is that in the future, look for this logo, um, uh, chargers and charging infrastructure that have this logo uh, will be able to be bi-directional capable. And so, uh, as I said with the plug slide, um, in order to even have the chance of being capable of uh, doing vehicle to home or vehicle to grid, you need to have a plug that has a DC uh, output pins that uh, or DC pins that can uh, enable that 
energy from the car's battery to be backfed out of the car. And there's not that many cars in the wild that have the CCS plug. Um, here is a, a, a short list of cars that do have the CCS plug. It's not a comprehensive list. Um, and then also I'm showing uh, some vehicles that have the Chatamo plug. Um, these would be the earlier generation Nissan Leafs and the Mitsubishi Outlander. Um, neither of these uh, manufacturers current vehicles use Chatamo anymore. They have also converted to CCS, uh, but we'll see in later slides that there are there has been a built up of infrastructure and chargers that can do bidirectionality uh, that were built back in the Chatamo standard. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of that in this presentation. And so out of that list, the number that are that have the um, not only the plug, but also the software capabilities uh, to be able to do bidirectional vehicle to home uh, is a much smaller list. Um, and this list will eventually get longer, we hope. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still so early in the uh, vehicle to home technology that um, vehicle manufacturers have not, you know, fully tested their vehicle with bidirectional chargers. And so therefore they haven't made any promises on compatibility yet. And so what, what's the main challenge? Like why, why has uh, this concept of um, vehicle to home been uh, so difficult? Um, well, one is that it's, it's much more complicated than you, you would think. And the reason for the complexity, it has to do with safety. Um, so traditional chargers um, really only feed energy into the car. And there's no, you know, thought of it ever backfeeding into a home or into the grid. But once you start having the capability of backfeeding into the home and into the grid, then you need to have a transfer switch. And the reason for this transfer switch is because during a power outage, um, you don't want to be backfeeding energy into your home and then with your home not disconnected to the grid, it will automatically have the capability of backfeeding energy back to the grid. And so then um, if during a blackout, uh, somebody's repairing the uh, electrical lines and trying to restore power, um, suddenly when they think that they're, the lines they're working on is dead, now they are live with you know 15,000 volts. And so that that is a major safety problem. And so every piece of equipment that can uh, send power back to your home needs to have the capability of disconnecting from the grid if it senses that there's no electricity from the grid coming into the home at the same time. And so that's really important, but a transfer switch is another piece of hardware. It's not an inexpensive piece of hardware either to be able to uh, switch an entire home's main uh, big fat wire from the, from the grid, be able to switch that wire between uh, the grid and into island mode uh, where it's just you know powering the home and that piece of equipment is typically around like an 800 dollars switch um so it and it has to do with just how beefy the equipment needs to be in order to be safe and be able to switch that much electricity um so that piece of uh, just the transfer switch alone is is not a trivial piece of hardware another thing is um you need to have an inverter because car batteries are DC energy and everything that we use in our home is AC. And so there needs to be an inverter to be able to convert DC energy to AC. And that is another piece of hardware that traditional chargers never have to think about or uh, you know incorporate into the charger. Um, and as a result in this diagram, what Ford uh, has done is rather than trying to bake the transfer switch and inverter into a uh, electric vehicle charging uh, piece of equipment. Um, they're proposing that when you buy a F-150 Lightning, that if you want the capability of powering your home with your truck, um, you would buy both the charging station and this, what they're calling home integration system uh, so that they're separate boxes. And therefore, 
for people who are just interested in charging their truck and not discharging the truck, the power of their home. They don't need to be, uh, they don't have to bear the expense of this uh, extra inverter and transfer switch hardware. And But if you do want that feature, you can then buy this additional home integration system uh, to be able to have the capability. And so uh, kind of the, because of these complexities, um, there has not been a lot, and not also the, the standard for that uh, ISO standard is only very, very new, finally finalized this year. Uh, so for the last you know decade, um, the market for EV chargers has grown and grown. So now there's probably over a hundred different make and model EV chargers to buy, um, lots of choices. The price of these uh, level two chargers um, that uh, can take 240 volts and charge your car relatively quickly um, have the prices definitely dropped a lot. Um, you can find lots of models uh, well below a thousand dollars, but uh, the the same cannot be said for bi-directional chargers. Um, one due to the complexity, as I said, like these pieces of equipment need to have transfer switches, they need to have inverters. So it's a much bigger bill of materials, um, but not only that, uh, but they're not common. So then that also increases the price of the hardware. Um, and so uh, right now there is pretty much no equipment in the CCS combined charging system uh, plug that you can buy that can power your home using your car. Uh, but Chatamo being an older plug and an older standard, a bunch of work has been done to uh, produce some hardware that can do that. But as you can see, the hardware is not cheap. Um, or three and a half thousand or close to six thousand British pounds. Yeah, that that's pretty expensive. And um, the number of vehicles that can do this is really mostly the Nissan Leaf and the older Nissan Leafs uh, at that. And so. I don't know that it's necessarily worth it to spend this kind of money uh, in order to be able to backfeed your older generation Nissan Leaf to be able to power your home, um, especially uh, knowing that if the Nissan Leafs uh, were, if you were to upgrade that car to another car, uh, that car, that newer car will for sure not use the Chatmo plug, but would use CCS. And then that will render the um, this bi-directional charger you've purchased uh, a, a defunct product also. Um, <laughs> so it doesn't sound like a really good investment to me, uh, but this is kind of what is available on the market uh, today. And so, as I said, a lot of work has been done in years past in this vehicle to home uh, technology uh, using the Chatmo plug and really kind of, and the Chatmo plug was mostly spearheaded by Nissan uh, uh, with their Nissan Leaf vehicle. And so across the world, uh, there has been many pilots done on this technology. And here's a map showing, you know, where all the different pilots have taken place. Um, so, you know, it it's for sure can be done. Um, but now that Nissan has switched to CCS, then now we've kind of reset the clock on, you know, we need to have new pilots uh, take place with the new Nissans with CCS plug, as well as other vehicles with CCS plugs. Um, there's also a lot of interest in the commercial vehicle fleet space uh, to be able to do uh, vehicle to grid or vehicle to building. Um, this is particularly imp uh, important because um, in commercial vehicles, typically uh, the timing of when the vehicles come in to park is very predictable and when they go out into the wild to drive around is also known um, and so then that allows uh, the fleet operators as well as the ut electric utilities to know okay well to a le high level of um, certainty when they will be plugged in and therefore when they will be available to discharge the power of the building or discharge to power the grid and so therefore a lot of utilities are interested in using uh, a fleet of electric buses or electric school buses or electric vehicles to work together in aggregate um, to form a virtual power plant. And these virtual power plants can be used to um, meet energy demands during the coldest days of the year or the hottest days of the year. 
Um, these are the days when um, the grid needs that extra energy. Um, but if it wasn't for these virtual power plants, then they would literally need to buy and um, maintain and operate a uh, peaker plant uh, to the tune of millions of dollars. Uh, meanwhile, that peaker plant would only need to operate for a very small number of hours in the year, but it's, it's very expensive to buy that infrastructure. And so uh, utilities are thinking it's a lot cheaper to you know, borrow uh, energy from and pay, pay the school bus company or pay the uh, company who is running the fleet of electric vehicles you know, a really shiny penny for those 10, 20, 30 hours a year when they need to uh, ask for some power from coming out of the school bus or the electric vehicle. Um, and that would be a lot more economical than buying a peaker plant that uh, only needs to operate for a few hours a year. Um, a good example is in California, there is a school bus fleet um, that's operated by Zoom and um, the uh, school bus fleet um, auto grid is retrofitting the, the buses to electrify them. And this partnership uh, is the first one in the North America uh, to operate a school bus fleet as a virtual uh, power plant. So that's happening right now. All right. So if the future of electric vehicles is in the CCS plug, um, what bi-directional vehicle to home charging hardware is out there? Well, it's all kind of vaporware right now. Um, they have, an, uh, two companies have for sure announced products, um, but neither of these companies have made promises on which uh, vehicles with CCS plugs uh, their charging equipment will be compatible with their equipment. And um, hopefully that, you know, they work together between the charging equipment and the vehicle manufacturers to, um, you know, uh, to figure out the software communication protocols uh, to enable the, the hardware to actually backfeed uh, high voltage DC into their charging equipment and then the inverter inside these equipment convert that energy um, into AC energy used uh, capable of powering a home. Um, this equipment is unlikely to be inexpensive. Like, you know, the as we saw on the previous slide, the previous generations to this equipment with the Chatamo plug was around three and a half thousand, uh, maybe even up to $6,000. Um, so perhaps that this, this equipment will be a little bit less, uh, inex uh, less expensive if it gets widely adopted. So there's economies of scale, um, but we're not sure yet. Um, but uh, besides the inverter and the transfer switch to make it safe to operate a vehicle to a home setup, um, there will also need to be um, some intelligence set up in the system because obviously you would, as a as an electric vehicle owner, you would want to set some you know minimum or uh, amount that of your battery state or charge that you would like the vehicle to home charger to be able to discharge your car's battery so that you know if you still need to drive, then you still have some energy left over to drive. Um, and then also, um, it, it, if you during a blackout, if you are powering your house uh, with your electric vehicle, are there some critical loads you want to remain powered or and, and then are there loads that you're okay with not being powered? Um, so like, you know, there may need to be some intelligence um, associated with either a smart electric panel such as span um, or communications to smart appliances. Um, there are now more and more appliances that are smart that can, you know, uh, curtail its energy when, you know, needed. Um, smart water heaters can do that. Um, there are now many uh, dryers and washing uh, dishwashers that are also smart, and you can um, tell them to basically suspend energy use for a certain period of time until like the electric grid is restored. Um, and so uh, there, there, there will be need to be some intelligence in terms of the communication between the vehicle and the bidirectional charger, and then also between the the bidirectional charger and loads. 
Um, and then if you happen to have solar and a home battery and a car capable of doing vehicle to home uh, bi-directional charging, then um, you need to be able to program the system to decide, okay, well, should we charge the home battery first or charge the car battery first? And, um, you know, to be able to set that prioritization. Um, and then of course the hardware needs to um, have some pre-testing because if anybody's gonna spend, you know, three to $6,000 on this equipment, um, they would really want some guaranteed vehicle compatibility, but not only compatibility with their current electric vehicle, but let's say, you know, I'm going to trade in or sell my current electric vehicle and buy a newer, you know, uh, electric vehicle that comes out two or three years from now, is that vehicle still going to be compatible with this uh, charger that I've spent three and a half to six thousand dollars on? Uh, so there needs to be some guaranteed vehicle compatibility in order to, uh, you know, drive this market. And then on the vehicle, the grid side, um, there, there needs to be some price signals, um, you know, uh, from the electric utility. Uh, currently, price signals the, in the residential world comes in the form of time of use rates. Um, those time of use rates are the same each week. Um, but in the future, maybe there will be a uh, scenario where the grid will have much more uh, dynamic pricing or what is called real-time energy pricing, um, in which case then uh, could this bi-directional charger be able to uh, have a live feed to the um, changing price of energy on the grid. So then if the energy is really inexpensive, it would then decide, oh yes, this is a great time to charge the battery because you know I can charge on low cost electricity. But then if uh, when the electricity is above a certain price, then, you know, to sell a certain number of kilowatt hours back to the grid. And, you know, so basically the, the idea is, you know, when you're at work or asleep and not driving your electric vehicle, maybe your electric vehicle could automatically be making you money by buying energy at the low cost energy and selling it back to grid during a high period. Um, you know, that, that would be a very desirable feature, I think, for a lot of people. Um, but then that requires some intelligence on the from the fleet manager or an individual to decide what those thresholds are. Uh, you know, uh, how high does the cost of energy need to be before you start selling energy to the grid? And of course, you know, you still need to have a limit on how much to sell. You don't want to necessarily sell until your battery is completely depleted. And then, in which case, then if you decide to drive the car, there's no energy to drive the car, and <laughs> that wouldn't make much sense either. Um, and then also um, uh, the, the future is that more and more electric utilities will want to aggregate uh, electric vehicles that are capable of this uh, vehicle to grid uh, feature and aggregate these vehicles together into a virtual power plant. Um, as I said, the reason being that uh, the electric grid has a, a need for energy during peak periods and they're willing to you know, pay a lot of money for per kilowatt hour for that energy. Um, the reason why is because the alternative is they would need to buy and operate and maintain a peaker electric plant uh, for those few hours uh, in the year when the, uh, they actually need to operate it. It'll be a lot cheaper to just get that energy um, from, uh, you know, the, the, from the, dis the distribution grid uh, having these uh, resources that can be aggregated into virtual power plants. Um, and then uh, this future of vehicle to plug load is pretty much here already. Um, and, and the reason why is because it's a much easier to implement feature. You don't have to worry about um, transfer switches to you know keep uh, energy from being backfed from the home and, and then uh, injuring a uh, electric lineman. Um, this Tech, this is where you're just literally directly plugging uh, loads such as um, uh, saws for construction sites or you know your, your refrigerator, um, laptops, et cetera, um, directly to the car. And so then you're not connected to the home's electric panel. Um, and so uh, the uh, Ford Lightning has plugs built in 
And then in the case of the uh, Kia, Kia and um, Hyundai electric vehicles, um, they will sell you a plug that you can plug into your CCS plug. And on the other side is a 120 volt outlet and that you can then plug in whatever thing you want. And the uh, limit to this uh, load is something around like three kilowatts. And then I think the Ford has a, you know, a um, plug load capability that's a little higher than three kilowatts. Um, but anyways, um, this type of feature is going to be, you know, more and more available on cars. And perhaps this feature will become more available before we even see uh, vehicle to home and vehicle to grid uh, grow stronger because it is much easier to implement. Um, the other thing is that uh, vehicle to plug loads is a feature that can be retrofittable to uh, pretty much all existing hybrid and plug-in hybrid vehicles. Uh, there's a company named Plug Out Power that sells you a kit that you can use to uh, retrofit an existing hybrid and plug-in hybrid to be able to uh, pull power out of the battery and be able to power plug loads. And there's a picture of kind of that setup in the lower right uh, of the slide. And finally, um, like I said, 2023 is the year in which uh, we'll see a ton of development in this vehicle to home and vehicle to grid um, uh, technology. And the reason is because um, the hardware manufacturers and vehicle manufacturers and charging infrastructure manufacturers will you know, really kind of uh, put their head down and get to work on this now that they are for sure uh, know know what the standards are and that they're not going to it's not going to be a moving target uh that they will have to keep like going back to drawing board making changes to uh because the federal government has finally uh finalized uh the standards and so um the in fact the ruling right now is that the uh, charging station uh, infrastructure has uh one year to upgrade equipment to conform to this uh ISO standard um and so we'll be seeing a lot of changes um, in the in the coming year. Um, and so as you see, this um, announcement was just made uh, just less than a month ago. And so uh, this is really exciting times. And um, with that, uh, I will take it over to questions. Yeah, and, did you see the two in the, in the Q&A? All right, yeah, 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 here, let me, okay. Um, what about GM's announcement that would look at whole uh, ecosystems of EVs, PVs, and homes? Um, indeed. So this slide here. So this home integration system, um, there is desires that this system, this home integration system, um, be also capable, since it has an inverter, capable of receiving high voltage DC from the vehicle and converting to AC, that there's an additional input for uh, solar, rooftop solar for PV. And, and so then the inverter will have two charge controllers, one that takes uh, D DC, high voltage DC from the uh, vehicle and one that takes high voltage DC from the string of solar panels on the roof. And that, you know, there will be not need, you would not need to necessarily have a solar inverter on top of this box, that this box will take care of it all. And um, that is uh, a, a for sure viable. Um, and in fact, on this slide here, this, company plug out power that makes this uh retrofit um kit to be able to retrofit a hybrid or plug-in hybrid vehicle to be able to power plug loads you would think that they have something some secret sauce to this kit but really it's not any secret sauce they literally went and bought a solar an off-grid solar inverter and they made sure that so off-grid solar inverter was capable of handling the input voltages of all hybrid and plug-in hybrid uh, batteries, and then they painted it red, and and put <laughs> stuck their logo on it. So the 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 idea is, um, solar inverters 
are already designed to take a range of high voltage DC uh, energy and convert it to AC. And in, from the perspective of a solar inverter, um, they don't care and they don't know the difference between a, a, a high voltage DC feed from solar panels versus a high voltage DC feed from an electric vehicle uh, batteries. And so that's why it's so easy to integrate photovoltaics and electric vehicles uh, using uh, solar inverters because the, the hardware is exactly the same. Um, and then in your automatic transfers diagram, I didn't see PV connection independent of the grid. Is there such a thing? Uh, yeah, so um, it, it, currently there may not be a uh, bi-directional vehicle to home charger that can take a string of PV, um, but certainly the hardware is capable. Um, I have personally... Um, hotwired my uh, plug-in hybrid vehicle to have a high voltage DC uh, feed coming out of it, um, as shown in this picture. And I have plugged that high voltage DC to a variety of solar inverters, and the solar inverter doesn't know the difference, and it can work with that energy. So uh, it is for sure possible. Um, and then a question, but if you need solar DC, what about systems that have microinverters and AC from PV? Um, yeah, so with those systems, so if you have an N-phase uh, solar microinverter system so that it's AC coming in from the rooftop into your home, uh, what you can do is there are inverters that can synchronize to that um, AC signal, and so then um, it, it, it would be a um, on-grid or grid interactive solar inverter that you would purchase that can take the high voltage DC from your vehicle and then produce an AC uh, energy that synchronizes with the microinverters and also synchronizes with the AC on the grid. Um, the challenge to that system is if you want to operate your home during a blackout and still have electricity, um, that could prove quite challenging because of that uh, transfer switch situation. Um, most microinverters, um, except for the very newest ones made by Enphase, um, have no uh, capability of remaining operational during a blackout. Uh, once they stop seeing the um, the the the, the AC signal from the grid, they are programmed to shut down uh, for safety reasons. Um, and then most grid tied inverters uh, are also programmed to shut down. And the only ones that are not are called hybrid inverters. And those hybrid inverters uh, have a automatic transfer switch built into them. And there are specific rules on how to wire them so that the transfer switch for sure disconnects the home from the grid before you know uh, islanding the home and then continuing to uh, power the home with uh, AC electricity. Um, can the battery in an electric car really power a home, fridge, computer, lights, et cetera, for how long? Um, yes. Uh, so the modern homes are surprisingly energy efficient. So meaning that if you, uh, unless you try to, you know, run your dryer, your water heater, your heat pump, uh, your electric stove, your dishwasher and run them all at the same time, most homes really don't draw that much energy all at once. And so the size of the inverter that you need is quite modest. You can run most homes on a five, around a five to, uh, yeah, around a five kilowatt, um, inverter would probably not be overloaded uh, and it'll be fine. And then in terms of energy, uh, electric cars have a lot of energy, um, way more than, so for example, a Tesla Powerwall uh, has a 10 kilowatt hour of energy in that battery. Most electric cars have 30, 40, 50, even like 
In the case of some Teslas, they have close to 100 kilowatt hour of battery. And so we're talking about, you know, three to 10 Tesla power walls worth of energy. Uh, so that's a lot. And so you can power a home for, in the case of a modest electric vehicle with like 30 kilowatt hour of battery, you can easily power a house for a day or more than, or one, one to two days. But if you have a um, car that has a much bigger battery, um, like think um, the long range Nissan Leafs that have like a 45, I think 45 kilowatt hour battery, you can power that for two days. And then if you have a Tesla, uh, assuming that Tesla ever comes around and decides to allow Teslas to back feed and power a home, they have batteries that could power a home for pretty much a full week. Um, so yeah, very, very sizable batteries in electric cars. Um, Chicago land, uh, will the slides and recording be available to participants? Uh, yes, it, it, this, uh, webinar is being recorded. And then, um, I've seen cheap kits that plug into one's EV 12 volt battery to provide plug power to plugs. I believe the capacity is about a thousand Watts. Are you familiar with these? Uh, yes, so these are basically um, 12 volt uh, inverters um, and they take you plug you wire them to the 12 volt battery side and and the reason why uh, the guidance is to keep your AC electrical demands at around a thousand watts is because the 12 volt system on electric vehicles was never designed to draw a lot of energy. The reason why is because um, in electric and plug-in hybrid vehicles, the 12 volt system is pretty much run computers, your car, your stereo, uh, the headlights, and um, that's about it. Um, most electric vehicles, uh, they they they've sized the 12 volt battery and the 12 volt circuit really small because um, they don't even need to start an engine. So in the case of like your regular Prius that the engine in that hybrid is actually started using the high voltage battery. So the 12 volt battery is never really stressed to even start an engine. Um, and so therefore you don't want to put huge loads on the 12 volt side. It was never designed um, to handle a ton of load. Uh, okay. Um, if the power goes out, how can the solar panels on my roof generate power? Um, that directly replenishes power in the battery of an electric car. Energy from the panel currently goes to the grid for net metering for PGE. Um, so Phil, for that, um, you would need to get a um, inverter that is capable of islanding your house. So you would need to somewhere in that system uh, get a automatic transfer switch to be able to uh, island your home and then therefore um, allow your, your solar system to continue to um, operate safely. Um, and then in that case, then you can run loads in your home or run loads in your, or, or even charge your car. Um, the technology to do that is a little bit uh, not yet developed. Um, so the reason for that is in order for that to work, um, let's say your solar system is generating, let's take a, pick a number five kilowatt of energy coming from the roof and your loads in your house is very low, let's say like two kilowatts. So now you have three kilowatt of excess energy that your car can absorb and utilize to charge the battery. But then let's say, you know, you power on a blender or you take a shower and your water heater kicks on. Well, now suddenly your home is using much closer to five kilowatts. The um, smart car charger, the car charger would need to be smart enough to understand that, oh, well, now I can't charge at three kilowatt anymore. I need to charge at next to zero kilowatt hour until the home's energy loads goes back down and then therefore it can pick up the surplus. Um, that requires a decent amount of intelligence. Um, 
And uh, I, I don't think that there's any product out there uh, on the market that's currently uh, capable of that level of intelligence quite yet. Um, is it likely that existing vehicles that have vehicle to load, like my Ionic 5, will be future compatible with new standards uh, for vehicle to house this grid? That is the hope. That is definitely the hope. Um, the uh, this uh, These two companies, uh, the Wallbox, uh, Quizar 2 and this Autel Maxi Charger, um, the Ionic 5 is kind of one of the vehicles that they're really eyeing on uh, to make compatible with this equipment. Um, the Ionic 5 is a um, a, a very, um, I guess, future looking vehicle, um, but it does have the CCS plug. And the, like I said, the, the thing that not all CCS plug capable vehicles are currently capable of doing vehicle at home. And that is really a software issue and not a hardware issue. They already have the, that CCS plug, uh, the combined charging system plug to be ca capable. And so the Ionic 5 in theory might need like a software update to update it so that it is compatible with the latest standard, this ISO uh, 15118 uh, standard. Um, and that may require some software updates but uh, I think you should be good. I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful for you. Uh, oh, okay. Is the EV 12 volt battery able to draw power from the EV's high voltage capacity battery? Um, it is. So um, uh, every uh, hybrid and plug-in hybrid and electric vehicle has on board inside its vehicle a DC to DC charge controller so that it can take um, high voltage DC and convert it to 12 volts to recharge the 12 volt battery side and power your uh, stereo and your headlights and stuff like that. Um, and so it is possible. The uh, it, You have to look at each car's um, DC to DC uh, charge charging system limits. Um, in the case of the Prius, I know for sure that in the case of a uh, third and fourth generation Prius, that DC to DC uh, charge, uh, 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 what's it called? A uh, power converter is has about a hundred amp uh, limit. And so then a hundred amp limit on 12 volts would be 1200 watts. And then obviously, if you then hook up an inverter uh, a, to convert 12 volt back to AC, that converter is not 100% efficient. So that's why uh, in the previous question, there's the there's the about uh, the thousand watt uh, limit. Uh, so then you know you now have that 200 watt of you know conversion uh, efficiency um, to kind of buffer yourself. Um, so um, all if you want to have a uh, system like shown in this picture uh, that can do like five kilowatt instead of a thousand or one kilowatt, but you want to instead use uh, get an inverter that can power more of your whole house, uh, which use you would need around a five kilowatt inverter. Um, there is a way to hook up to the high voltage battery on your Prius uh, or other plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Um, Vehicle warranty and uh, personal safety, those things you have to be mindful of. This is not um, like this plug out power uh, retrofit kit is for sure not uh, approved by any electric or hybrid or plug in vehicle manufacturer. You're not going to get, you know, a, a blessing of Toyota or a blessing of Kia to do this. Um, <laughs> but it can be done and it can be done safely. Uh, but it's something that you're going to have to do on your own. Um, and then uh, the span panel. Um, how does the span panel resolve connectivity issue vehicle to home? Um, so the span panel, uh, as I said, one of the challenges to, um, if you are interested in, in a blackout power outage situation, um, you let's say your solar panel can only produce five kilowatt and you're getting five kilowatt of uh, energy coming from your solar panels, um, the span panel can really help manage the home's loads. So let's say like, you know, you turn on your electric stove 
and that uses a lot of energy. So then the span panel could then like know that, okay, well, the stove is a high priority load, but the uh, electric water heater is not. So then um, given that you're now limited on how much energy is being produced, the span panel can, uh, you can program it to like, you know, turn off the circuit to the, your water heater so that it's not drawing any power and then prioritize the power to power your electric stove. And as soon as you're done cooking your lunch, then, you know, it senses that, okay, well, the electric stove energy demand is much lower now. So then I can restore power back to electric water heater. Um, another example would be like, for example, if you don't have electric water heater and it's only the electric vehicle and your electric stove uh, competing for power, then it can, you know, turn off the circuit to charging your car while you're cooking. And then as soon as you're done cooking, then it will then know that the energy availability is uh, back to uh, your home's load is much lower now. And so then it can then return on the circuit to uh, charge your electric vehicle. Um, but span panel is currently uh, at the level of intelligence of turning on and off circuit breakers. Um, it's still not necessarily intelligent enough to be able to ramp up and down the charging rate of your electric vehicle. That level of uh, communication between the electric vehicle and the span panel, that's still something that is uh, being developed. Um, for sure, it is cap it, the, 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 the hardware capability is there because like in um, every plug-in hybrid and uh, electric vehicle, you can set the charging rates. You can set it to like eight amps, 15 amps, 30 amps. You know, you can, you can go into your car's menu system and adjust that. So for sure that, you know, your car's onboard charger can, you know, vary its charging rate but then that communication needs to kind of be connected to the span panel. Um, okay, so that's Q&A and then chat. There's also some stuff in the chat also. Okay, let's look at the chat. Um, I looked at the, have you looked at the Enphase system and new bidirectional charger? Uh, yes, so Enphase has a uh, product. So out of, on top of this product with a wall box, Quizar, uh, two and this Altel Maxi Charger um, Enphase is also coming up with a product uh, to do the to to add to this list of products. Um, that one is the reason why I didn't put that one in this list is because uh, from my research, Enphase has announced that, but they haven't even created like uh, something that you can see and touch, to my knowledge. So it's even more vaporware than this stuff, which is already kind of vaporware already. Uh, so. Um, who knows? Like I said, 2023 is a year of major like uh, uh, improvements and gains and developments in this uh, vehicle to home uh, market. And so I would not be surprised if Enphase, you know, really kind of floorboards their developments. And then, um, you know, before the end of 2023, they have a product you can actually buy. Um, I've been using an inverter on my EV, 12 volt power some appliances. Is there a better way to do vehicle to plug, especially? Uh, for cars that may not be uh, CCS compatible. Um, yeah, so uh, if you're trying to power things that are bigger than like a refrigerator or phone and you want to start powering things like your electric stove, um, then you really cannot use your 12 volt battery system to uh, power those bigger loads. You would need to uh, start connecting a solar inverter to the uh, main high voltage battery of the vehicle um and uh that's the way to do it and then and uh, yeah especially for cars that may not be ccs compatible so yeah that is the way to do it um on cars that are not ccs compatible is to you know manually hook up uh some wires to the high voltage battery um i am not going to give you instructions on how to do it even though it can be done safely, because um, uh, that is not sanctioned by the vehicle manufacturers. So you're never going to get the blessing uh, from any vehicle manufacturer if you choose to do that. And there may be some warranty issues associated with that. So uh, uh, proceed at your own risk. Uh, but if your car is already out of warranty and you feel like you're that's something you want to do, hey, have at it. <laughs> Um, this has been so great. I really, 
I'm so glad you had so much time for questions because people had great questions and it really showed the depth of your knowledge. So thank you for sharing all that with us. Um, do we have any idea what's what's on for for the future of these talks or are we we're still thinking we, about we, we do so the next talk is going to be talking about uh bat we're going to you know, transition back to um batteries in the home and we're going to specifically look at uh batteries and what the new uh fire codes uh that's coming up uh by ul and so underwriters laboratory is a uh major uh equipment safety evaluator and they say the underwriters laboratory not only certifies equipment but they release a guidance on um, kind of how to build products so that they're safe and then nfpa the national fire protection agency uh, they also have some rules that have been released on kind of uh, how much batteries you can put in your house and then how where they need to be placed and how close they've been placed to each other and that's to kind of prevent the uh, uncontrolled spread of fire from one battery to another and causing a chain reaction. Um, and we'll get into the, kind of those rules and um, whether they are good or bad, um, too restrictive, not, re you know, um, stuff like that. We'll get into that June 3rd, uh, the next first Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, so look forward to that presentation. Um, I look forward to creating the slides. And we'll see you uh, next month, first Saturday at 10. Perfect timing. Thank you so much, Edward. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And we we'll hope to see you next Saturday. The recording will come out in an email to you. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.